All right, we will call this meeting to order. Uh, it is August 30th, 2023, 6 p.m. And uh, welcome to the Northern Region, Northern Region Regional Advisory Council meeting. This meeting is being held in person uh, at the Weber County Commission Chambers in Ogden, Utah, as well as being streamed live on YouTube. Uh, this is a public forum allowing you to express your opinions and proposals on the management of wildlife in our state. This RAC considers your ideas, opinions, and proposals and reports them to the Wildlife Board. The Wildlife Board, not the RAC, is, in char is charged with setting wildlife pol policy for our state. We all have ideas and opinions about what is best for Utah's wildlife. We approach this with tremendous emotions and passion. I encourage all who wish to express their opinion to do so. However, I ask that we respect opposing views on the issues being discussed. I would appreciate the audience keeping their emotions in check, allowing all individuals to freely express their opinions. Appropriate conduct will provide smooth meeting flow, allowing the RAC to listen, digest, and address all concerns, opinions, and proposals offered for consideration. Rude comments, booing, yelling, hooting, and snickering from the audience while individual comments are being offered will not be tolerated. If inappropriate behavior persists, the offender may be asked to leave the meeting. Uh, <clears throat> we will start with a welcome to the RAC members. Um, being this is the first meeting with some new individuals on the RAC, we will, as we go through with the roll call, um, though we have six new RAC members and four, four of them are in attendance tonight. So as we go through, you're one of the new RAC members, you want to just take a brief moment, um, share an introduction of yourself, your background, um, and we will uh, go to that point. Let me start down here with Ross. Uh, yeah, Ross Worthington, uh, represent public at large. Um, been involved in, in the outdoors and wildlife since I was a kid. So I lived in Utah pretty much my whole life outside of a few years for uh, not hope for my career, but uh, excited to, to represent and serve the public and yeah, help, help with things as they come forward and, and lots of uh, the challenges of, of managing the wildlife and, and protecting the wildlife and, and the things that we love and hold dear. Um, my name is James Carlson from Farmington, Utah, and representing the public at large. Uh, same, I think most of us here are, ha are either avid outdoors men and women or um, people that are here to help wildlife and management. And so uh, I'm excited to be able to see more of what goes on and work with a lot of good people and hopefully get some good things accomplished here in the city of Utah. Uh, Randy Hutchison, I've been on board for a little while uh, at large uh, from Ogden. Ryan Brown, I've been on the board for council for a little while as well. Public at large from Camas area. I'm Marshall Alford, uh, new member representing uh, National Forest Lands. Um, Rob Dale, I'm from Farmington and uh, also have a great interest in uh, wildlife. Uh, happy to be here and uh, look forward to what we're going to do. Hi, I'm Jamie. I am in Wellsville, Utah, and I come with an obsession for Great Salt Lake and uh, wildlife in general, and I'm representing um, non-consumptive users. And we have one online, Nikki, you want to go ahead and? Sure, I'm Nikki Wayment. Um, I, like Jamie, represent the non-consumptive users and I am the executive director for Hawkwatch International in my day job. Thank you. Um, I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Brad Buchanan, uh, representing sportsmen and, and serving as the chair of the Northern Rack. So uh, we do have uh, have to excuse David Earl, Junior Goring, Darren Perry, Casey Snyder, and Steve Sorensen, who are not able to, to make it. We also have um, an additional member on their way um, who's caught up in traffic. So Jessica Wade will be joining us later. Um, 
We would like to welcome uh, DWR staff who joined us tonight and uh, providing who will be providing presentations and will be available to answer questions throughout the meeting. Uh, Randy Offlinger will be uh, kind of the star of the show for us tonight. So uh, we welcome the public that are attending in person and watching on YouTube. Um, those that are attending in person will have the opportunity to provide comments regarding an agenda item. If you wish to make a comment, you must fill out the comment card uh, in the back in, for the item you wish to address and see that uh, we receive it prior to the RAC discussion. Uh, the public that are watching on YouTube will not be able to provide live comments during the meeting. However, the presentations were provided for viewing online and the public was able to provide comments to the RAC members for this meeting. Okay, I think that starts everything. So to our first agenda item will be uh, the approval of the agenda and minutes from the last meeting. entertain a motion i'll move that we accept the meetings the minutes and the today's agenda i will second that okay motion by randy seconded by uh, jamie and i'm not going to call for an individual vote but all by raise of hand okay thank you passes unanimous and <clears throat> we'll now move uh, on to the summary of the motions from the most recent wildlife board meeting held on June 8th in Farmington. Um, try to put this together. So uh, during the board meeting addressed mainly the wild turkey and upland recommendations that came through as well as the swan hunt recommendations. So. Um, there was a, a motion made by uh, Randy Durth, seconded by Gary Nelson, to approve the wild turkey plan and recommendations as presented by the division. That passed unanimously. Um, we had a motion made by Carl Hurst and seconded by Gary Nelson to approve uh, the upland game recommendations as presented by the, by the division, and that passed unanimously as well to the waterfowl and swan hunt recommendations. So we had a motion made by Carl Hurst um, to approve the amended recommendation making the take of trumpeter swans legal but a possession illegal. That died for lack of a second. Uh, another motion was made by Bryce Thur Thurgood and that was to uh, motion that if the quota reaches 10 trumpeters taken then public shooting grounds and Bear River Bird Refuge would, would be closed to swan hunting. Uh, that motion also died for lack of a second. We had a motion made by Wade Heaton and seconded by Randy Durth to approve the division's original recommendations as presented, and that passed unanimously. Um, for the live game birds rule amendments, we had a motion made by Randy Durth and seconded by Carl Hurst to accept the live live game birds rule amendments as presented and that passed unanimously. Uh, we had a motion by Gary Nielsen seconded by Carl Hurst <clears throat> to approve as presented by the division, the collection importation and possession rule amendments and that passed unanimous. And for the CWMU variance request, we had a motion made by Bryce Thurgood, seconded by Randy Durth, uh, that they deny the CWMU variance request until after the committee makes a recommendation and it goes through the process. Um, and that passed with Chairman Albrecht breaking the tie with three opposed. And on the translocation management plan for desert tortoise, we had a motion to approve the translocation management plan that was made by Carl Hurst, seconded by Gary Nelson, and passed unanimous. And this informational item, they had an election of a new uh, wildlife board chair, and Randy Girth was elected as chair, and Gary Nelson as vice chair. Oh, 
we had two meetings since our last RAC meeting, two board meetings, I apologize. So on the board meeting on August 17th, uh, it was for the Expo permit audit. We had a motion made by Wade Heaton and seconded by Bryce Thurgood uh, to accept the Expo permit audit as presented by the division. And that passed unanimously with one recusal. And for Expo permit allocation, we had a motion uh, made by Bryce Thurgood and seconded by Kent Johnson to approve the Expo permit allocation as presented by the division. That passed unanimously with one recusal as well. Okay. And any, we move on to regional update. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Trying to make this quick so your first meeting can be quick. Hey, go ahead and advance the slide for me, Paul. It's been a while since we've since we've met, so a lot has taken place in the region. I had a lot of employees doing a lot of great things, but we'll try and capture just the highlights. Um, in the wildlife section, we're processing CMU applications. We review these every other year, and it's a pretty big uh, workload. Our biologists meet with operators and landowners and make the make the program come together. So we're working on that. We're doing preseason elk and pronghorn classifications. Um, we're also working on unit elk plans in the region. That has not been super easy. So uh, lots of work on there, but mountain goat flights are also taking place. If you've never been on one of those, that might be a fun opportunity for rack members. Next. Bless you, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I know a guy. <laughs> Um, some of our unsung hero work, we've got um, lots of nuisance and depredation issues and conflicts with, uh, with producers. And we've got employees that spend uh, overnight hours counting, counting wildlife and uh, depredation and nuisance issues. So um, in addition to that, we've got dead wildlife in the roads and backyards, lots of snake issues throughout the summer, um, injured birds. And uh, we're always pushing our education to, uh, about living with wildlife and wildawareutah.org is kind of our source that we often push to and we have a lot of conflicts with users out in the, out in the mountains. Slide. Um, there's been a big effort for pelican trapping and pika surveys and we're building what are called modus towers. Those are towers that are able to pick up uh, frequencies or signals from birds that have a, a collar so a lot of our pelican trapping is to put those bands on and then we can pick them up through our modus towers. Next slide. Uh, this is supposed to be hidden. So next slide, sorry. Next slide, those are from the last one. Remember we were covered in water. Feels like eternity ago. Next slide. Um, at the Great Salt Lake, the lake's down about a foot and a half from its max of 4194. Salinity levels have remained stable and um, thankfully, brine shrimp demographics are at or above average for this time of year. So that's very promising compared to where we feared we could be. And our Great Salt Lake crew has also helped oversee and complete the regional shorebird survey, um, which wrapped up earlier this month. Next. Are you going to talk about how pelicans disappeared from Gunnison Island, abandoned the island? I wasn't going to, but you're welcome I, to. I would add that. that you know, pelicans have completely abandoned Gunnison Island, which is a major nesting spot for these pelicans and one of only two places in Utah. It was a huge um, production area, you know, presumably because of predators on the island and less food in their freshwater habitat. I would say cumulative effects of that. And I, like this has never happened before. So I think that's something really notable. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Have we heard where they went instead if they? There's, I, I mean, their numbers have been decreasing over especially the last 10 years with drought conditions. And I don't think anybody really knows. Um, there was lots more water this year. So instead of being concentrated in these small areas like Ogden Bay, Farmington Bay, they were probably spread across the landscape more and harder to really get a grasp on that, but 
um, that's um, TBD. Like we, I don't think they've done some avian influenza work, and um, I don't, I don't think that that's showed up in the pelicans that I've seen. But um, we, don't, we don't know. That's actually been in the media. Thanks for bringing it up. Uh, so our law enforcement team who also oversees AIS, they're working on a dip tank that will be coming to Bullard Bay. We've seen really good success with these at Lake Powell and other water bodies. So this will be something that voters can look forward to in the future that uh, ought to help ease the ease the voting experience, hopefully. And uh, UDOT finished uh, building an inspection station for us on the east side of Bear Lake at Lake Town. That's been a long time in the works and should be a, a safer and nicer facility for voters and for our employees. Next slide. Um, probably the biggest effort that law enforcement's been up to is they hosted the NOWIA, that's how they say it, North American Wildlife Enforcement Officers Association. Did I get that right, Lieutenant? <laughs> it's a, um, a North American meeting that brings law enforcement officers from the wildlife field together for training and, and we hosted it this year. There's a picture of the officers that were in attendance the meeting was in Provo and it was a huge success. It was a massive effort by our officers um, and the Utah Conservation Officers Association. Next slide. Um, in aquatics, we've broken ground on a new community fishery in West Haven City. The name of that is the Pond at Poultry Preserve. Uh, there's an address there in case anybody's interested. The pond will be five service acres and it's set to open in the summer of 2024. So don't rush out there just yet. And, throw a line in the dry dry dirt. But uh, it will be eventually stocked with trout, largemouth bass, bluegill, and channel cats. And as per usual, our, our role is usually to consult on the design and construction of ponds. So thanks to the aquatic staff for, for doing that and partnering with our neighboring cities. Next slide. This is also a super busy time of year for our fisheries crew doing all manners of surveys. They've done gillnet surveys at Bear Lake, East Canyon, Lost Creek, and Causey Reservoirs. Um, as well as fish and mussel surveys in the Upper Bear River. Those are native fish surveys and native mussels. And cutthroat trout surveys in streams, including hard scrabble, Echo, Gordon, Peterson, Strawberry, and Lost Creeks. Probably more of those to come too. Next slide. Um, some notable stocking. This was also in the media. Our native fisheries crew and our aquaculture um, staff have been working on for a number of years to make to grow bluehead sucker in captivity and stock them in the wild. So we had a stocking event of eight inch bluehead suckers, a thousand of them. And it, just doing that alone should double our population in the Weaver River. The bluehead suckers are fish that is uh, native to portions of Northern Utah. The ones in the Weaver River are a little bit different than the ones in the snake. So um, it's important that we maintain that population and maintain those genetics and diversity. We also stocked 508 inch tiger muskie in Pineview Reservoir. Um, in the past, we've stocked fingerling muskies, and those are uh, susceptible to a lot of predation amongst themselves, mostly. So this marks our first time uh, stocking larger fish, and hopefully we get better survival rates, and also save some money in our aquaculture system. Go on that route. Next slide. Our outreach section hosted a women's fishing tournament at East Canyon Reservoir back in May. We had 60 women participate. Um, most of the fish were caught from shore. The largest was a 24 inch rainbow, but I think if I remember right, the notes were that like 80% of the fish were 17 inches or bigger. So a lot of smiles that day, it, great event. Um, we also had a recent fire that at the East Canyon WMA, it was caused by lightning, but thanks to our partners at Forestry Fire and State Lands, they were there at the contained within the day and kept it to 30 acres. It happened on the 18th. I'm out at the Cinnamon Creek WMA, we were working on three uh, structures in Red Rock Creek, which are beaver dam analogs. We've also had a lot of dedicated hunters working on the property. They were able to roll up and remove a mile of old fence that was causing a mess. We've done a lot of weed control and road repairs. The place is really looking really nice. And our habitat management plan committee continues to meet, and our next meeting is on the 12th. And hopefully, um, into the tail end of that process and we'll have a plan for like to review soon. Next slide. Now but hardware, um, our hay production was really good this year with lots of moisture. So we had 185 tons harvested this year. 
which when combined with our 85 tons remaining from last year puts us back in a much better place where we should have enough for feeding operations next year and hopefully have a little bit extra going into the following year like we used to have. So we're recovering from low supply during the drought. Our habitat teams also work on the Mahogany Ridge phase two project. That's a juniper removal, um, about 1400 acres. It's on both Forest Service and at the hardware WMA. We're working with a neighboring landowner at Coldwater Ranch to construct a one mile fence of wildlife friendly fencing. We had some habitat vacancies that we are uh, working on with Sorno's retirement. So Melissa Early has been re, uh, promoted to the assistant habitat manager. And that leaves one open position for a recruitment that we're running right now for a habitat biologist. So we'll be sure to introduce our new employee when, when that time comes. But, and nothing happens in our region without the support of our administration, administrative staff. They're the unsung heroes in the background that get things done for us and we just couldn't operate without them. We've hired a new office specialist named Alex Paradise on the first. And we had a huge um, sales month. And our team was able to do that in spite of our office remodel, which is still underway and it's really coming together. But I think we're going to have nicest regional building in the state and it'll, it'll pretty much match and mirror the other regional buildings. But we're pretty excited to move into our new digs. Next slide. This is for rack member opportunities, the preseason elk and pronghorn classifications. Um, we'll be doing CWD sampling at deer check stations during when the uh, deer opener starts. There's still more electric fishing and gillnet surveys that I'm sure our fisheries crew can get you guys on. No, Jamie had fun with that last year. I think the mountain goat flights are over for this year, but if that's something you're interested in, man, <laughs> well, I think we, we can hook you up with that. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little bit disappointed that I didn't know that was an option. <laughs> I had to let you know after I took the seat in the chopper. <laughs> okay, any questions before we move on? Thank you. Okay. I do actually have, do have a quick question on the Cinnamon Creek WMA. Do we know when that plan is going to be presented? I don't know for sure. We're we've got that meeting coming up on the eleventh. We've got a couple of key issues that we're going to chew through. Um, depending on how that meeting goes, that could be our last meeting, but we might need another one. So we're leaving it open ended because we don't want to pressure the committee into making a decision because of some predetermined timeline. But we'll we'll tee it up in the in the meeting as soon as it's ready. So hopefully one more meeting, maybe two for the for the committee. Uh yeah. Early. Okay. Any other questions? All right, thanks, Ben. Yep. Um, a lot of good things going on. Um a lot of things continuing to to take place. We do um Unit management committees for elk population objectives for some of the regional stuff up here have been part of, and a lot of good work by the division staff. Um, just for information for the RAC, we're also the CWMU Rule Committee has been meeting, I think three meetings now, and a couple more planned for this year. So more good stuff to come all through next year. So okay. <clears throat> Um, we will move on to, I guess we'll call it our first agenda item for the night, um, 2024 fishing recommendations, Randy Opplinger, um, have anything you'd like to cover with us before we get started or anything related to this item? Yeah, I just want to cover just one thing real fast. Actually, it's two things, but, uh, we'd like to propose just a, a, a pretty simple amendment to our regulation package that we're proposing. So we want to uh, continue to propose the same spear fishing regulations that you guys saw on the presentation that I provided. But in addition to those, we'd like to propose the addition of two new community fishing uh, waters here in the state. So the first one is that um, pond of Polder Preserve that Ben talked about in his regional presentation. So that's here in the northern region. And the other one is a new community fishery in Roosevelt. So that's out in the north northeast region. 
Uh, neither of those community fisheries are open yet. We're just proposing that we add them now to the list of community fishing ponds in the state. That way we're doing this preemptively. So when they open next summer, they're already on that list. So we don't have to do an emergency uh, fishing regulation change to add them to the list of community fisheries in the state. Okay. That's, that's what we got. Thank you. Um, we all had the opportunity to uh, review and, and look over the uh, presentation online. So uh, we will start off with any questions from RAC members for Randy on 2024 fishing recommendations. I have a question. <laughs> Um, it, when it, this actually came from a public comment about you had put information in there about like scuba gear. Is, is there any kind of like concern about in like putting diseases into the system for, you know, scuba gear going to and fro? Yeah, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't know. I've never heard any serious discussions about that. I, I think it probably is a discussion we need to have. I don't know how many people scuba dive broadly in the state and our waters. And I don't know what fraction of those are spear anglers, but I mean, you're right. I mean, this is equipment that could potentially have stuff on it, kind of like ropes and other things. So I think we could bring that back and discuss it, and discuss whether we need to make some changes. But as it stands right now, scuba equipment is allowed for sco or spear fishing. So we're not changing that. All we're proposing is a change in the definition to make that more clear because it takes a bit of a deep dive in state code to come up with that right now. the new rack members i always ask questions this is <laughs> um just this is just more a quick question because you know it's come up before the spear fishing how big of a deal is this in the state is it a small group like falconeers where there's like 50 of them but they're incredibly well organized or what what brought this about yeah what brought this about it i i'm not sure an exact number i mean I, it's it's somewhere around one percent of our anglers so that actually probably puts it around a couple thousand people so it's a surprisingly large number um there's at least two groups that i'm aware of in the state who are heavily involved in spear fishing who regularly meet and do various you know kind of weekend events where they get together and go spear fishing what this came about is those groups actually got together and they came to the division and they said hey we'd like some more spear fishing opportunities in the state can we talk about this a little bit and you know i said this in the presentation but really what we're proposing is the byproduct of the conversations we had with those groups thank you Any other questions from RAC members? Okay, uh, any questions from the public on this item? Okay, seeing none, we will uh, have been summarized the public comments for this. Okay, we had, <clears throat> excuse me, we had four total votes, we only had four votes next item doesn't have any public so you can skip it for the next item but we had uh, three that were strongly agreed and one that neither agreed nor disagreed the only input we got was from one voter who said that the recommendations are common sense that they help base of species removal and that 90 percent of the England public supports it thank you uh, we will now move on to public comment. Just a reminder, if you have uh, would like to share any public comment, we'll need to uh, fill out one of the blue cards and and get it to jo uh, Jody. We will start with uh, just a reminder. So if you're representing a group, uh, your time is five minutes. And rep uh, individuals are given three minutes. So we'll start with Jeff Salt. Representing Utah Anglers Coalition. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to address the council. My name is Jeff Salt. I'm the treasurer for the Utah Anglers Coalition. And we are a nonprofit uh, organization. We've been around for almost 20 years and we meet 10 times a month and we are supportive of all forms of angling in the state of Utah, including spearfishing. 
even though we don't have any members in our group from the spearfishing community, but we support their activity. Um, we're made up of uh, different angling organizations, uh, retailers, guides, and other uh, representatives from the angling industry in Utah. And we are specifically in support of the rule change for spearfishing because uh, as we mentioned in the last paragraph of the letter that's just been uh, handed to you, uh, the increased spearfishing opportunities in, in waters and for species where there is no limit is a good thing and where catch and kill regulations are in place. We think that that's a good thing. And we also believe that uh, helping the spearfishing community will address the problem of illegal species introduction, which is one of our primary uh, objectives and, and uh, values for our organization. So we're fully in support of the rule change. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, next up, Ken Strong, representing SFW. Ken Strong, representing Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife. First of all, if I'd like to thank all of you for your service. I know it takes a lot out of, uh, out of your time to do this and we so appreciate all of the regional advisory councils and all the work you do. Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife <clears throat> is, a, is in full support of this new proposal from the division. We think it's a great opportunity for the spear fishermen and, and for everybody involved. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Thanks to Ken as well, he just finished his rack tour on the central rack a few months ago so uh any other public comment for this item have any okay uh we will move on to rack discussion well i'm going to pause right there so we were joined by jessica wade so um if you want to take a moment just to give a brief introduction for yourself? You, you have five minutes for your speech. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not to put you on the spot, right, when you walk in or anything. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, this is my first meeting and uh, transitioning from um, Emily Jesko as the Bureau of Land Management rep. So I uh, look forward to working with you all, and uh, maybe you can tell me the, all the rules at, at the break. Or <laughs> yep. the, all right, all right. You bet. Thank Thanks. you. Welcome. Um, it's a good night. We have a lot of great new RAC members. Appreciate everybody and willing to take the time out. And, and like the canon mentioned, there's a lot of time commitment there. So appreciate everyone. Um, so on the subject 2024 fishing recommendations, any uh, discussion from the RAC members? Just going to make a quick comment. <clears throat> Aquatics are my weak area. I'll admit that up front. But there's more, more people fish than hunt in Utah. And you guys do a great job. There's very little pushback on most of the recommendation you guys uh, make, which to me says that you're doing a great job. So I appreciate it very much, um, the effort you guys put in, and you're supporting a lot of people in their enjoyment of the outdoor. Probably should ask maybe during the question section, but how problematic is like the invasive species type stuff? Where is, because a lot of places you got to stop for even like a paddleboard or a kayak versus with this scuba equipment. I'm just like, is that something that needs to really be considered Yes, this type of sports fishing gets more popular. Yeah, I mean, we, we do have concerns, you know, broadly about invasive species across the state. And we've got one water in the state with quagga mussel, so Lake Powell. And, you know, a lot of our efforts statewide are really aimed at trying to contain that to Lake Powell and preventing that from spreading to other waters across the state. If it were to get in other waters of the state, it certainly has some implications on fisheries. It has some impacts on Really water quality in the food chain. So there could be some implications for fish growth and fish condition. 
also they're so numerous they've got some implications as well if they get established in the system really to the, just the water system so there's some documentation particularly out in the midwest of them clogging public water intake valves and things like that so i think you know from both a fisheries perspective and really from a, a public utility kind of perspective there's a lot of interest in preventing the spread of particularly that species you know zebra and quagga mussels but you know we have other invasive species as well we've got didymo which is sometimes called rock snot which is kind of a nasty slippery algae that grows all over uh, i don't think it's really a problem in lakes as much as streams that's one example the eurasian milfoils uh, a plant that's an issue that becomes very abundant you get choked out waterways make it very difficult to boat make it difficult to fish new zealand mud snails are a species we worry about and um particularly our stream kind of settings they could become very dominant and have some implications in the food chain so I'm, I'm just bringing up some examples, but I mean, we do have these concerns about invasive species statewide. And I don't know what the risk is of scuba equipment transmitting it, but you know, getting back to your original comment, that it probably is something that warrants a little bit of looking at, and particularly if we see an upward trajectory in the popularity of, um, of spearfishing across the state. And to just add a comment too, that outside of this recommendation and potential regulation, the <clears throat> the use of the equipment is is legal too so it's it wouldn't even if someone is a scuba diver and they're taking advantage of this new activity or new new opportunities something they could already be doing and the threat wouldn't be elevated as a result of the recommendation but also scuba de gear doesn't tend to pool water and it's not a vessel so that's that lowers the risk as well um whereas in streams too that's largely from like a felt waiter where it's in contact with the substrate and can carry the, the vector to and from. So it, it it's something that I think we need to look at and consider, but it's, as we talked about it internally, we just felt like it was a low risk. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think it is much lower risk than a boat or waders or some other things. And Ben hit on this, but scuba diving is illegal regardless if you're spearfishing or not, and probably swimmers in a water, you know, have a similar risk as scuba divers. So. You know, as other groups who are participating recreationally you probably have a similar risk. And on Randy's note, I would love to compliment the DWR. I mean, when I worked for the DWR in the early 2000s, we were talking about keeping quagga mussels out of water bodies. And in my head was like, there is no freaking way that like we're going to keep these little things out. And Utah has done a really awesome job of that. So complimenting the aquatics group. Yeah, and law enforcement takes a lot of props for that as well. That, that program largely resides within our law enforcement section, so our, our officers are hugely attuned to that, that issue. And, um, and we've got biological monitoring that happens in the aquatic section too. But big props to our officers. There's nothing else. I'll make a motion. Yeah, go ahead. I'd make the motion to accept the proposal as presented. Motion made by Randy. To accept as presented. Do we have a second? I'll second. Seconded by um, Ross. I'm going to get everybody's name. <laughs> it may take me a few meetings, but I know your face, but I can space your name for a second. Okay. Uh, any discussion on the motion? only question I guess I have is do we need since it changed with the additional information do we need to add those two other water bodies to that or is that just part of the proposal um, with your clarification those became part of the proposal correct yeah Probably a better I, was, I was just gonna say that the motion was to to accept it as presented and the presentation in, included the online presentation and what Randy shared at the introduction, but thank you for clarifying. Question. Any other discussion on the motion? Okay, I'll call for a vote. We'll go through alphabetically here. Uh, Marshall? I, I agree. Ryan? Yes. Jamie? Yes. James? Yes. Robert? Yes. Randy? Yes. Uh, Jessica? Yes. Nikki? Yes. And Ross? Yes. 
Motion passes unanimous. Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on to our next agenda item, private pond rule amendments. Uh, back to Randy for you had a clarification on this one as well. Yeah, I got two points of clarification on this one. I really, the first one is that in my original proposal presentation that you watched, I mentioned that we were in the process of working with the Virgin River uh, Fish Recovery Program on identifying some additional species for stocking in the Virgin River drainage. I think in my presentation, I, I said we were in the process of working on it and we were had in the works maybe two to four additional species that we were gonna propose the opportunity for stocking in that drainage. Well, we're kind of at a point now where we've actually formalized the memorandum of understanding with the Virgin River Recovery Program. So I'm in a position where I can say the species that we're formally proposing. So those added species that we're basically proposing to add in the Virgin River drainage for allowing stocking. So this is an added thing to the proposal is uh, wiper, black crappie, triploid grass carp, and tiger trout. The other thing I wanted to bring up was a point of clarification on something that came up at last night's RAC meeting that really revolved about the public process that we followed, particularly with dealing with the private aquaculture industry here in the state when identifying the set of changes that we're proposing to the private pond rule. Uh, as a point of clarification, the DWR did introduce the proposed rule to the private aquaculture industry ahead of the RAC and wildlife board meetings and provided the industry the opportunity to weigh in on the proposed changes. Uh, we did this by providing an informational at a fish health policy board meeting. The fish health policy board meetings are public meetings and they're the primary forum where Utah's private aquaculture industry gathers to discuss issues within the state. As a result, the DWR felt like this was the best opportunity to discuss the role of the industry. Statewide, there are three established active private aquaculture facilities. Two of those facilities attended this meeting and both expressed support for proposed rule changes during the meeting and have not expressed any concern since the meeting. So I just wanted to bring that up because there was there was some conversation yesterday about you know what the process we followed to introduce the rule to the private aquaculture industry. I just want to mention that was the process. So I was bringing it to them, and in that meeting, giving them a chance to weigh in during that meeting. Okay. Thank you, Randy. Um, <clears throat> we will start off with any questions from RAC members on this agenda. Item. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, on the Virgin River, the uh, tree species I think you mentioned, uh, are those native fish? Those are not native fish. And there was four species. It was wiper, oh, geez, black crappie, tiger trout. I may have missed tiger trout. I apologize if I did. And triplet grass carp. Okay. So just, so again, aquatics is my weak area. I'm more um, up in games and, and birds. But why? introduce non-natives we're well non-natives primarily are what people are interested in stocking in their private ponds there isn't much of an industry for selling native fish honestly the only native sport fish we've got in the state are cutthroat trout which you think st george you think hot temperatures it's really not a place that trout are well adapted to so you look statewide you know people are largely interested in non-native fish outside of cutthroat trout you look at the bulk of stocking in our private ponds it's usually rainbow trout but there's some other species that get stocked but anyway, just by way of background, in the past, in the Virgin River, we've got a, basically a recovery program. We've got agreements in place with the federal government and other adjacent states. And there's a couple of endangered fish species that live in the Virgin River drainage. And there was agreements in place to prevent stocking of certain species that had been documented to have significant impacts on fishes in the Virgin River drainage. Since then, we've collected some additional information about fish populations that we know more about the interactions of various species. And the species that we're proposing are ones that we don't feel like have adverse impacts on those native fishes in the Virgin River drainage. So that's how we arrived at that list. Any concern with any of those fishes going places we don't want them? I, well, okay, so all those fishes that we're proposing, well, I should take that back. Uh, two of those fishes, so tiger trout, and triple A grass carp are sterile. So they're unable to reproduce, which means that if they were to escape a private pond, it's dead end, they're not gonna reproduce. If we look in the case of the other two, so we had black crappie and wiper, I guess I should take that back, wiper, sterile, I forgot sniper, wiper. They're sterile as well, so they can't reproduce. Black crappie can reproduce, but these are river fishes and black crappie don't do well in a river setting. So 
if black crappie were to escape, we're not too worried about them actually establishing populations just because of the biology of those fish. Just add one thing that what mo most people don't know is most non-native species introductions are unsuccessful. Hopefully our program reduces the risk of it happening. And if it does happen, I think we've got biological reasons why I think the risk is low. Yeah. And I should add to it, um, the other way fish can be moved is illegal. You know, people, you know, put fish in a bucket or something like that and transfer them across the state. That That's illegal. That's covered under state code. That's something people can't do. But one of the intentions with having a private pond rule is to provide legal avenues for people to purchase fish and stock them in settings that we feel like are contained settings where they're going to have minimal impacts on our sport fisheries and our native fish. So that's part of the reason we've got this rule. But that to get to your original question, that's the other way. You know, these fish could escape, naturally reproduce, or people could move them. And through this rule, providing a legal route to do that, but people do it illegally, it's illegal. That's covered under code. Yeah, no, I'd be happy to have a conversation with you about it. Any other questions from REC chair or REC members? Okay. Uh, any questions from the public? This is going so well. <laughs> this is a good first meeting. Okay. Um, so these private ponds, are they regulated by the division for fishing? Like, do they have the, do these private ponds have the same, have to have a fishing license and are they bag limits or is that, since it's a private property, does that not even matter? That doesn't matter with it being private property. So our rules say these private ponds are on private property. That means the private property owner essentially has the liberty to set their limits and how they want to manage those waters. They also pay for the fish that are placed in there. So it's yeah. not a public resource and a public investment. Yeah, the state does not stock these ponds. We, as a policy, we do not stock on private land. Um, so these are privately purchased fish from privately owned fish hatcheries across the state. Sorry, I forgot. I got, I got <laughs> on the fish you're talking about, and I forgot my main question. Um, so I remember the figure correctly: the hundred thousand dollars a year that, that you guys spend on adding invasive species various places what makes you comfortable because i know in your presentation you also mentioned that there are states around us that don't allow any private why are you why are you comfortable we're comfortable with this um because well let me clarify we've we've got a unique rule here in utah most states either don't allow stocking or in all circumstances they require a certificate of registration or some kind of license to allow people to stock fish under their private pond on their private property our rule is somewhat unique where if you look historically going back about a decade ago we had some discussions with the private fish growers in the state on ways to reduce the amount of regulation on private pond owners to make it a little bit easier for people to purchase fish without going through a licensing or a COR process what we landed on is we've got a rule that's got kind of two routes. So there's options for ways you can purchase fish without a certificate of registration and options for that require a certificate of registration. For the options that don't require a certificate of registration, they're very contained situations where we have very minimal concern about fish. So it's limited to species that are sterile, that can't reproduce. So if they were to escape, we don't have to worry about them establishing a reproducing population. On top of those, those ponds have to be screened, which means you know basically you're putting some physical device there to prevent fish from escaping. And those ponds have to be off a natural stream channel. And the reason that's important is a natural stream channel is basically a highway that leads fish to our public waterways across the state. So we're really only providing this option for no COR for these fish that can't reproduce in really dead end situations where those fish cannot escape and go anywhere else. In other situations where people might want fertile fish that can reproduce, so their pond is on a natural stream channel, or they don't want to put screens on their pond, those situations require a certificate of registration, which gives us as a division the opportunity to evaluate what the plans are for that pond and consider the implications that that stocking could have on the management of our fish across the state or the conservation of our fish. So that gives us the, the opportunity to review those, provide recommendations, and through the COR, kind of certify what's allowed and what makes sense from a biological perspective. 
not looking for a boogeyman, but Indian invasive species that have been treated in the past at various water bodies. Have they come from any of these private ponds that you know? These, well, I mean, first off, from private ponds, I'm not aware of what's on private ponds, but those should be dead end systems. And what I mean is fish in a private pond can't be moved to another private pond or anything like that. We have privately owned fish hatcheries across the state. There's there's really three of them that are really active. There's some that kind of jump in the business sometimes and aren't that heavily involved. But as part of their licensing process with the Utah Department of Agriculture and Food, they have to go through an invasive species inspection every year, which is really the same inspection that we put through our fish hatcheries, so the DWR fish hatcheries. And what that does is basically certifies these private facilities are free of invasive species before they're stocking. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. <clears throat> um, we had no public comments to summarize on this one, correct? All right. Uh, moving on to public comment, we only have two cards. This agenda item, uh, we'll start with Jeff Salt again, representing Utah Anglers Coalition. Uh, for the record, Jeff Salt, Utah Anglers Coalition, and we are here tonight to speak in favor of the proposed rule change. Um, generally speaking, whenever there's a rule change and there's an affected interest group, there's usually going to be a lot of questioning and misinformation and a lot of defensive action. Um, but in this case, this particular rule doesn't change the status quo. It doesn't really change anything. The main purpose of this rule change is to reorganize the way the rule is written so that it's easier for the growers and the public and for legislators and administrators to understand what is actually going on. So the, the rule has been restructured um, in written form so it's much easier to understand because it has been cumbersome and difficult for people to navigate the rule because it's a lengthy rule and just a lot of like, and I, I'm a legal assistant by trade and I have a hard time reading the original rule. <laughs> so we support the reorganization of the rule to make it more clear. And uh, the, the rule actually also benefits the growing industry, which there are, as uh, has been mentioned, only three producers in the state. And there are some out of state producers that sell fish to the state of Utah, but uh, this is primarily for the benefit of the fish growing industry. So this is a good rule change. However, there are some potential pitfalls uh, with any activity involving wildlife and, and raising and stocking wildlife, uh, especially fish. So we, you know, we support uh, the rule change, but we also are cautious that is as this goes on that there is not going to be an opportunity for the fish growers to possibly uh, introduce or implement some less stringent triploid testing protocol so we want to make sure that the state requirements that are in place for triploid testing stay the way they are and they're not weakened because that could uh, potentially cause uh, problems uh, with the introduction of the fish if they're not tested correctly uh, to make sure that we're getting the sterile triploids. Um, in addition, we also support the expansion of the species that are included in this rule change that benefit the industry. So this is better for the growers uh, to have more species added to the list. <clears throat> and we also support the addition of the language at the end of the rule that clarifies and reinforces what's already in statute, the criminal penalty for violating the rule. And there is always an opportunity with growing and transplanting or stocking fish to break rules. The rule uh, in statute, the criminal penalty is class A misdemeanor. This rule stipulate you know states that again and this is actually going to be helpful for law enforcement because it's now in two places and it makes it harder for somebody to violate and say they didn't understand what the criminal penalties were so we think that that's a good thing 
and in general, we, we uh, support efforts to protect uh, sport fish and native fish populations from escapement on privately stocked, uh, from, of privately stocked fish and uh, the protection of sport fish and resources and native species and conservation uh, are key elements of our mission as a nonprofit. And one last comment uh, for Mr. Hutchinson. Uh, in the state of Utah, we have over 500,000 licensed anglers. So we're a big group of people. And fishing in Utah contributes uh, roughly $1.3 billion to the state economy. So even having these growers and providing this little niche of privately stocked ponds, uh, there's a benefit for that. So we do support the activity overall. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> uh, next up, Ken Strong, representing Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife. Ken Strong, the Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife. Uh, again, thank you for your service. <clears throat> I want to say that uh, SFW is really supportive of this rule and the things that they're doing. Uh, our division has made a real, our, our division, the Utah Division of Wildlife has made a real effort uh, to help these private pond fish growers survive and they've given a lot to them. And I just wanna say that I think that Drew and Craig and Randy have done a super job making Utah one of the best places to fish in the Western United States. So hats off to them and thank you for your time. Thank you, Ken. Okay, that concludes public comment. Uh, we will move on to rack discussion for this agenda item. All right. We'll move it along then. Yeah. I, I, to accept the recommendation as presented. Motion by Randy. Second. Seconded by Marshall. Any uh, discussion on the motion? Okay. Call for a vote. Marshall? I'll abstain. Ryan? Yes. Jamie? Yes. James? Yes. Robert? Yes. Randy? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Nikki? Yes. Ross? Yes. Motion passes unanimous with one abstention. Uh, do you have any comment for your abstention? Definitely. Um, I didn't see an intersection with uh, forest lands. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. And that concludes our agenda for the evening. That was short and sweet and well. So thank you for everyone. Uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Any opposed? <laughs> <laughs> Motion passes. <laughs>